Welcome to Arosium and our second English speaking video or Swinglish. If you have to stand out with my accent here a bit. Anyway, today we are going to talk about an uh, engine, uh, which can sound sounds kind of boring to some, but bear with me because this is a very special engine. It is the R1830R Twin Wasp that was built by the company Pratt and Whitney. Uh, the story begins really in 1927 when the engine manufacturer in the United States, Pratt and Whitney, presented the new engine Wasp. Wasp was a radial engine and while the Wasp was quite successful, it uh, took only a few years until Pratt & Whitney unveiled, in 1932, the developed version, the Twin Wasp. And this is the Twin Wasp. The reason for the name Twin Wasp was that basically what the company did was take two Wasp engines and place them on top of each other. Since these were radial engines, this gave the Twin Wasp a uh, so much staggered appearance. You can see here on the cylinders that are placed. If you look, you come forward here. You can see there's here. Basically, I have the first row of cylinders going here, and here behind the second row of cylinders come overlapping in a zigzag pattern. So you can say there is two Wasp engines put together, and therefore the name Twin Wasp. The Twin Wasp came to be one of the most one of the most important aircraft engines in history. Maybe not the most famous, but very important. Very important. And over 1,779,000 1, of these were produced. And the most famous aircraft to carry this engine was the revolutionary Douglas DC-3 passenger and transport aircraft. Here, you go. Oh, here I have a little model in the Swedish colors of the DC-3. And uh, this machine basically revolutionized the passenger, passenger aircraft industry and uh, come, came to serve as the blueprint for the modern airliner. And uh, many DC-3s still fly today in more remote areas because they are rugged, they are dependable, and so was their engine. Uh, Pratt and Whitney's slogan was dependable engines, and you can really say that Twin Wasp was dependable and became very popular. During the Second World War, several of the heavy Allied aircrafts, for example the US B-24 Liberator bombers, used the Twin Wasp. So the engine clearly earned its place in history. However, there is a Swedish connection to the Twin Wasp that is not so well known, and that is what I'm going to talk about more. You see, in the early days of the world, Second World War, Sweden had realized that it was in a pretty bad position. Uh, aircrafts had turned out to be very important, and the Swedish fighter defense was mediocre. We had about 48 Gloucester Gladiator aircrafts, newly purchased from Great Britain, but sadly it was an aircraft that was a little bit dated already when it entered production. It was a biplane, two-winged biplane, with a closed cockpit, but still it couldn't keep up with the modern fighters like the Spitfires and the Messerschmitts. Sweden desperately needed more fighter aircraft and modern fighter aircrafts. So in 1939, the third United States, who was basically the only one willing to supply quality aircrafts by the time, and the first choice the first purchase was the Republic Seversky EP-1, which was an um, all-metal monoplane powered by the Twin Wasp. Sweden ordered 120 of these aircrafts, and uh, soon after, they ordered 144 further aircraft of the type of, from the company Volte. Uh, however, this last batch of fighters would never arrive. Together, 
On top of this, Sweden also ordered a large stockpile of twin WASP engines, specifically the twin WASP C3. And the idea was, to, was that you, should, you needed spare engine for the aircrafts and you needed modern fighter engines, modern aircraft engines for planned future Swedish-made fighter aircrafts. However, everything, all of this came to naught when the United States in 1940 put an arms embargo on sales to many countries, including Sweden, with the reason that they, really, they basically feared that, well, they would be overrun and um, then Germans would get all the arms. So they decided not to sell. Sweden got 60 of the 120 Seversky, Republic Seversky EP1s. These came into Swedish service as the J9. And J9, J9 is the Swedish station, and J stands for Jakt, which is the Swedish designation for a fighter aircraft. So we got 60 of the 120, and we got a few extra engines. And that was all, all of these orders. No Vulti aircrafts ever emerged in Sweden. So Sweden was in a fix. They couldn't get, we couldn't get m modern aircraft in the United States. We couldn't buy the engines we had paid for. So what was Sweden to do? Sweden needed more fighter aircraft and Sweden had. So Swedish, Sweden realized that we had to build them themselves. We could buy, we got to view a few second sortings aircraft from Italy, but they didn't really cut it. So we needed our own aircrafts. But to have an aircraft, you need engines, and Sweden didn't have the engines either. So desperate times take desperate, demands desperate measures or as the as Swedish saying with a similar meaning, nöden har ingen lag, the law, uh, the, the emergency has no laws. Swedish government ordered the Swedish engine manufacturer, Volvo Flyg, uh, Svenska Flygmotor, later on Volvo Aero, to basically reverse engineer the twin WASP. Sweden didn't have any license, we weren't getting any license, but we had a few engines and aircraft. So the Swedish engineers basically had to go down, strip down the engine, measure everything, and start reworking it from scratch. It was downright piracy, totally illegal, but desperate times takes the most desperate measures. And the engines, they, this would take time. There was no doubt about that. It's not something you do in a hurry, but there was no other option. Sweden needed a fighter aircraft and developed and the project started under the designation J-22. You can see, for example, a, a replica up here of the J-22. It was a quite remarkable project uh, using a lot of independent manufacturers banding together under central control to manufacture the aircraft. Saab was already fully committed to building this, the dive bomber B-17 and the medium bomber B-18. So there were no options for them to do it. So they had to come up with a separate solution. But big problem was still, there were no engines. You could have a nice aircraft, but with no engines, they were useless. So Sweden, and while waiting for the Svenska Flygmotor engineers to, to have success with their piracy, Sweden went shopping abroad and started looking. It turned out that Nazi Germany had captured a stockpile of uh, twin WASP C3s engines from the French Air Force during the invasion of France, 1940. And uh, after much uh, work and uh, diplomacy and etc., Sweden finally managed to coax the Germans to sell Sweden 115 formerly French engines in 1943. Probably the Germans thought that, well, those engines are a bit dated now, so we can, may as well sell them to the Swedes and get some iron ore. But in Sweden, people were overjoyed. We finally got a decent engine. And this engine here is one of the French engines the, who were, were produced in the United States for the French. And uh, if you look down here, you can see there is a plate with uh, specifications. And it says that it's Pratt & Whitney signed engine, but there's also the specifications are in French. So that means we know this is a French engine. And these 115 engines arrived in 1943, and they were key 
to allowing Sweden to finally start producing the J-22. However, 1942, the year before, Svenska Flygmotor had already managed to make a successful test run with their own home-built Twin Wasp, or as it would become to be known, STV C3, Swedish Twin Wasp C3. And uh, true to their standards, the engineers had managed to tweak the engine to be better than the original. And uh, so the Swedish Air Force, while receiving the first, the French engines, also ordered over 500 engines from Svenska Flygmotor in 1943. And these engines were to be used for the J-22 and also for the future B-18 medium bomber. So thanks to this, Sweden managed that at least at the end of the war have decent aircrafts, had modern aircraft with decent power plants in the Twin Wasps. So far, so good. But come the end of the war. And um, you can say, it's safe to say that Pratt and Whitney were not amused the slightest over the Swedish outright piracy. With no license, no agreement whatsoever, Sweden had made over 500 engines of their own. This was piracy, this was illegal. And uh, Pratt and Whitney wanted compensation for this, naturally, from the Swedish state. And uh, this could be something of a problem for Sweden versus the United States, being a small country versus a big one. It's so complicated. But there is another twist to the story. Sweden had one ace up their sleeves. And this was, this story went back to 1941, when the Swedish arms manufacturer Bofors had sold a license to the United States to produce their excellent Bofors L60 40mm anti-aircraft gun in the United States, as I said, under license, for the need of the American armed forces. Bofors 40mm gun was already then seen as probably the best anti-aircraft gun in the world, and it would be and it is today known as maybe the best anti-aircraft gun throughout history. And, uh, but the thing was that already in 1941, when the papers are signed, the United States start distributing American-made Bofors guns to Great Britain and other allied powers during, on base of the Lend-Lease Act, which the US used to, before America officially entered the war, to be able to supply arms and uh, weapons, aircrafts, and ships to Great Britain, for example, in exchange for other things. However, Bofors naturally saw this as a great breach of contract, because in the end, if the US supplied these guns directly to the British, the British wouldn't buy them from Bofors. And the wouldn't, British wouldn't bother buying any license from Bofors either. So Bofors, already in 1941, tried to sue the United States. And uh, through the years, Bofors kept up this barrage of trying, in American courts, trying to get compensation for what they saw was outright piracy for the United States. However, this turned out to be Sweden's good luck, because when the Pratt & Whitney came and said, hey, we want compensation, you are pirates, piracy copied 500 engines of ours, we want refund, we want compensation. Sweden countered, well, you have probably manufactured more than thousands of thousands of, of Bofors guns, and you had no license to give them to the British. Okay. So, there was a stalemate, and uh, in the end, Sweden and the United States agreed to let bygones be bygones, and uh, Bofors sort of made a, gave the, arranged for a contract, for the United States and forget about everything. And Pratt and & Whitney also, in fact, gave Svenska Flygmotor a retroactive license for the engines already produced. So in the end, it all turned out pretty well. And uh, as I said, Svenska Flygmotor became Volvo Aero, and Volvo Aero became the main Swedish engine manufacturer of the jet engines for the Swedish Air Force. And Volvo Aero never really made their own engines, but they specialized in buying a license for a foreign engine, tweaking it, making it better, and then using it in Swedish forces. So you can say they already started there. They got, they got, they, what you say, 
they got very much experience doing that in the work with the twin wasp. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to say farewell and hope you enjoy the story. Until next time, bye.